Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by our patrons. We haven't had any sponsors in a little while. And this week we're going to do another watch party on Discord with our patrons. And we're going to be watching Jurassic Park 3. Bet you didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah. And you can sign up on Patreon at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. This week in our 281st episode, we have a bunch of news, including a new dinosaur nicknamed the Wonder Chicken. But I think its real name is even better than that. It's really good. Is it the awesome chicken? No, it's Mm. better. (laughs) But you gotta wait for it. (laughs) We also have an interview with Ralph from Cake Boss, the one who was the head sculptor that picked out Zool for their massive thousand pound cake. Yeah, and that's on Buddy versus Duff. Yep. It's a pretty addictive show. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Alaska Cephalae. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week, we would specifically like to thank Chris, Nicholas, Trent Carbajal, Stefan, Taya, Stego Sophie, Ayumi, Paula Canthus, Jackson Crawford, Sorian Brandy, Mayu, Dino Bo, Mellow Stego, Worger Source, Kaylin, Duncan Source, Maria Sora, and Daniel McGill. Yeah, thank you so much to all of our patrons. As Garrett mentioned, we'll be doing another watch party. We really enjoyed the last two watch parties we've done. Oh, they're so fun. (laughs) Yeah. So if you want to join, then you should join our community on Patreon at patreon.com slash inodino. Yeah, we're going to be watching Jurassic Park 3, like I mentioned. We're going to start six hours earlier than we started the last two watch parties. So we're going to start at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time so that it's still technically... Uh, at least the movie afternoon <laughs> in the U.S. and Canada. It'll be 4 p.m. Eastern, and that makes it 8 p.m. UTC so that some of our European friends can join because it was rough. I think it was like 4 a.m. or something where somebody was trying to watch from. 5 a.m. when it ended. It was brutal. So hopefully it's a little easier on them this time. As a quick reminder, everybody watches on their own devices. We don't like stream it through Discord or anything. We're just going to sync up at one point point in time and then we're just going to chat in discord while we watch it separately i think it works pretty well i was a little bit worried that it'd be hard to watch the movie and the text at the same time but i think it's kind of nice because you can just watch the movie for parts that you really enjoy and then you can check it periodically to see what people have mentioned and it's not like interrupting it like it would be if we were talking at you through it or something so i think it works pretty cool the sync point we're going to use is going to be when the jurassic park 3 logo presumably when the spinosaurus slashes through it to make the three (laughs) shows up on the screen which on our dvd is in about 44 seconds but obviously that varies a lot so that's why we pick a point to start from so we're going to start at the jurassic park 3 logo at 1 p.m pacific time on saturday april 18th and i'll also put this in the discord jumping into the news our first article is about that wonder chicken as promised what's the real name Hold on. (laughs) I was promised an even better name than Wonder Chicken. Well, I got to tell you who published it first. So it was in Nature and written by Daniel Field and others. So, okay, the real name is Asteriornis Mastrictensis. But Asteriornis is a super cool name. It's after the Greek words Asteria and Ornis. So the Ornis part is obviously bird, but Asteria is super cool. So they say, quote, In Greek mythology, Asteria is the goddess of falling stars and transforms herself into a quail. Ooh, extra bird. Yes. And it's got like a double thing going on here because the KPG mass extinction is caused by what might have been an asteroid. And the Hmm. word asteroid has the same Greek root because asteroid means star-like. So the falling stars being Asteria, it's still about like stars and like the KPG mass extinction impactor hitting. It works on that level. And then also Asteriornis itself, the bird slash dinosaur itself, may have been an ancestor to the modern quail, which is what Asteriornis was turning into. So many connections. I know, it's so cool. How wonderful. It is. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> like a wonder chicken <laughs> yeah and then i should also mention maastrichtensis not nearly as fun but you could probably guess it was found in belgium in the maastricht formation which is the type locality of the late cretaceous maastrichtian stage 
And since it's such an important formation, it makes sense to highlight it, I guess. This Asteriornis that they found was about 66.7 to 66.8 million years old when it died and when it lived, because that's a rounding error in there. That makes it very, very late in dinosaur paleontology because non-avian dinosaurs died out 66.0 million years ago. So this is within, we're in the hundreds of thousands of years range now. So like seven to 800,000 years from when dinosaurs went extinct. And it's, quote, the oldest unambiguous crown bird fossil yet discovered, end quote. So crown birds are basically birds. I mean, <laughs> they call them crown birds because there's this whole thing about how you define what a bird is. Is it like, can it fly? Is Archaeopteryx a bird? All that kind of stuff. But the crown bird group is like what we think of as birds, basically. So it's like the oldest definitely bird bird that's ever been found. Hmm. The find itself is really cool, although really small. As fizz.org put it, the fossil is about the size of a deck of cards with some little leg bone fragments sticking out of it. Oh. So yeah, that's really, really small. It's like palm of your hand sized fossil, basically. Based on the leg fragments, they estimate this Asteriornis weighed about 394 grams or about 14 ounces, which is about four quail. (laughs) <laughs> We're using quails as an analogy, which I think we should. It makes sense, yeah. It's still relatively small for the group that it's in, though. I think they said it's like the, in the 20th percentile for size. So quail are just incredibly small. But Well, yeah, and they got the tiny eggs. They do. <laughs> That's true. That's Sabrina's favorite thing about quail is eating their eggs. <laughs> <laughs> They're delicious. So just based on those leg fragments, they couldn't tell all that much. But they put it in a CT scanner, and amazingly, they found a nearly complete 3D articulated skull inside of it. Wow. The wonder. (laughs) The wonder and the chicken. (laughs) Or wonder quail, maybe it should be called. Before I explain what the skull is all about, I should give a really quick background on modern birds, since this is sort of at the branching point of a bunch of different modern birds. So there are three to four major groups of modern birds. You've got Paleonathae, Galloanserae, and Neoaves. So Paleonathae is ostriches and other flightless birds, basically. Sometimes they separate all the other ones into Neonaths, and then you've just got like a very, very small group and one enormous group. But I think it's a little more useful to split out the Galloanserae. And Galloanserae is basically the fowl group like land fowl and water fowl, they call them. It's basically a lot of stuff that we eat. <laughs> I think that's kind of where the fowl terms comes from. It later got split into galliforms, which are the turkey, chicken, and quail. And then the other half of galloanserae is the anseriforms, which includes ducks, geese, and swans. So those are the land and water fowls? Yeah, when you combine all those things together. It's kind of a weird group, but you'll see why I'm grouping it this way. And then there's the Neoaves, which is all the other birds. So Asteriornis looks like an early member of Galloanserae. And like I said, that's the combination of waterfowl and landfowl. And that's because it seems to have traits of both of them. And they've previously assumed that these landfowl and waterfowl probably had a common ancestor because they have a lot of similar characteristics in their jaws and stuff. Mm. So this is sort of more evidence of that because we've now got this bird that's like halfway in between a landfowl and a waterfowl. Looks like a duck must be a quail. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Overall, to me, it looks more like a tiny Edmontosaurus skull than like a duck or a chicken or any other kind of bird skull. So it doesn't have like a separate beak in front of its head like you see on a chicken skull. It's got that same sort of sloping nose that goes all the way down to the end tip of the snout. You know, like with an Amontosaurus, how it's kind of a big triangle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the separate and it doesn't have like a big bulging eye socket in the back like you see in most modern bird skulls. But it obviously compared to an Amontosaurus, it has a toothless beak. So the jaws are smaller and it's a lot more pneumatic. So those holes in the head are a lot bigger. But just glancing at it as a non-paleontologist to me it's like that looks kind of like an amontosaurus skull (laughs) definitely more so than a chicken (laughs) you probably could have guessed phylogenetically it's closer to galliforms than it is to anseriforms 
So I think that you could call it a turducken because turkeys and chickens are both galliforms and a duck is an anseriform and it's kind of like it's two part galliform, one part anseriform. So I think they should call it the wonder turducken rather than the wonder chicken. (laughs) (laughs) Doesn't quite roll off the tongue as easily. It's sort of a counter to Vegavis, which is from Antarctica and it's sort of its cousin. It's around the same point in time, but it's closer to Anseriforms. The authors say that Asteriornis was found near a, quote, Ichthyornis-like bird, end quote. So I did a little bit of digging into their sources, and I found that it, there was this other bird that was found in the Maastricht Formation a few years ago, and it was from 65.8 million years ago, which is actually 200,000 years after the KPG boundary. Hmm. It's a little bit weird because it's called the Maastricht Formation, so you'd think it's all in the Maastrichtian, which is before the KPG boundary, but part of it is after <laughs> the KPG extinction, and that's how this bird is. So the same formation basically has one of the last Cretaceous birds and first Paleogene birds on either side of that boundary, although it is likely that the ichthyornis like bird existed before because it's only 200,000 years. A lot of times species last longer than that. So it was probably around in the Mesozoic as well. But we don't know for sure whether or not Asteriornis survived through the extinction or not. We just know that dinosaurs similar to it survived through it because we have their ancestors around today. Asteriornis is also more evidence that modern birds or things that are like modern birds coexisted with what they call avialin stem birds, which are basically like weirdos like Archaeopteryx and stuff, which aren't really bird birds (laughs) because they had teeth or had other strange stuff going on. But they were something that probably evolved eventually into something like a modern bird. But previously, you could draw some of these lineages as going directly from these toothed weirdos into a, a modern bird and not have them coexist at the same time. But now now that we're definitively pushing back these real bird birds <laughs> into the Mesozoic, you can see that they were coexisting. So you had the Enantiornithines and things like that coexisting with this wonder chicken. You keep saying bird, and I think of that song. Bird, bird, bird. Bird <laughs> is the word. Yeah. In this case, it, it kind of is. <laughs> They're not exactly sure where Asteriornis lived. They think, though, that like Ichthyornis, it probably lived on the shore. That's based on its small body mass and its long, skinny legs, plus the sediment that it was found in. Garrett, should you live on the shore? No, I'd burn too easily. (laughs) (laughs) But I do have a relatively small body mass for my height. And you got long legs. Uh, Very long, skinny legs. That's true. And you eat fish. (laughs) i eat other things too that's true (laughs) they're not sure if asteriornas ate fish (laughs) and that's because you know they just found this toothless skull and nothing else there's no gut contents there's there's also no wings really the key yeah there's also no wings so we don't know if it flew and you know we just have a little bit of the legs and the skull So there's very limited information about it, but the skull is one of the best things to find if you can pick a part of the animal to preserve in good detail. So we at least know where it fits phylogenetically. One way the authors summarized its significance was by saying that Asteriornis is, quote, one of the only well-supported crown birds from the Mesozoic era and is the first Mesozoic crown bird with well-represented cranial remains, end quote. Sounds pretty awesome. Basically the first really good true bird skull from the Mesozoic. Yeah. The authors also put a big emphasis on the fact that since this bird exists in the Northern Hemisphere, that the Northern Hemisphere might have been just as likely of a place for some dinosaurs, meaning birds, to survive the KPG boundary. Whereas before we've talked a lot about how Antarctica was the most likely place, obviously in the Southern Hemisphere. And I would say with that Ichthyornis-like bird, that was around 200,000 years after the boundary in the Maastricht formation. It seems like they have a point. But there are a lot of papers that are continually showing that polar coasts were the least affected by the KPG cold period, and Belgium was really close, relatively speaking, to the Chicxulub impact compared to Antarctica. So 
So would have had to be a pretty tough bird <laughs> to make it through that transition. It's not impossible, but it would have needed the right set of traits. And the best guess at the traits it would have needed are small size, which it does have, living near the shore, which it also seems to have. But we don't know if it lived in trees, and that would have been a big problem because all the trees burned up. We also don't know what its metabolism was like, but if it had a high metabolism and needed to constantly eat, that would have been a really big problem with scarce food around that giant asteroid destroying all of the food to eat. And we don't know if it was capable of eating a varied diet, which is incredibly important in these sort of disaster taxa, because you might not be able to find the exact same food every day. And if you rely on like one fruit or something, you're doomed. <laughs> you need to be able to eat a lot of different stuff, especially they think that if you could eat seeds and insects, that would be a good way to go because there's probably a fair number of those around even in a extinction event. This is why I'm convinced that something like a seagull is going to re-inherit the earth because they have all of these characteristics. <laughs> they can literally eat anything. Yes. And live anywhere. And they don't live in trees. They live near the shore. And they're fighters. Yeah. And they're just crazy. You just ask Sabrina about her hot dog. <laughs> mm. I don't trust birds. In other news... Get some news about a stegosaurus. Wally, the stegosaurus, who's from the Berkshire Museum in Massachusetts, is getting restored and will probably be fully restored by fall. Wally's a life-size stegosaurus sculpture that weighs 1,200 pounds and has been on the front lawn of the museum since October of 97. It's made of fiberglass and is the second stegosaurus made from a mold by Louis Paul Jonas Studios in Hudson, New York. The first model was made for the New York World's Fair in 1964 and 1965, and it's now on display at Dinosaur National Monument in Harper's Corner, Utah. I think we might have seen it, Garrett. Oh, is it that outdoor stegosaurus we took a picture in front I of? I think so. It used to be our Patreon image for the stegosaurus level. Yeah, it's a cool one. It is really cool. They painted it some really neat colors. Mm -hmm. So Wally, this stegosaurus, got its name as part of a community contest where the winner, Levi Bissell, named him because stegosaurus has the brain size of a walnut. Oh. Yeah. Um, before going to Berkshire, Wally was on display for 30 years at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. And at Cleveland, Wally is known as Steggy. And the museum commissioned Steggy back in 1967. And when Steggy was ready... The museum's women's committee hosted a dinner in June 1968 to welcome Steggy the Stegosaurus. And they had Stego Jurassic, and they listened to a talk by Dr. Alfred Romer. And then in 1997, according to the museum, quote, the first Steggy retired to greener pastures, end quote. And, you know, that, that means Massachusetts. So later that <laughs> year, the museum welcomed Steggy 2, which is an identical version cast at the same studio as Steggy the First. And the Women's Committee had a Steggy birthday party to welcome the Stegosaurus. And since 2001, Steggy has been greeting visitors at the entrance of the museum. In 2016, Steggy went on a short spring break and then visited research locations around the world. So there's pictures of Steggy fishing on a hike in a nature preserve and hanging out with Littlefoot and Spike plushies. Hmm. So this started out Wally's getting restored, but then there's a whole history of Wally the Stegosaurus. So Wally the Stegosaurus was formerly known as Steggy 1? Mm -hmm. And now there's a different Steggy, Steggy 2, yep. which is at the Cleveland Museum. What's the one that's at the Dinosaur National Monument? The original model, the first model made from the cast. Oh, so that would be like Steggy Senior or something. I don't Steggy think it has the a name. Zeroth. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. So there's three of these now from the same mold. Mm -hmm. That's cool. And now we're going to go on to our interview with Ralph. This week, we're joined by Ralph Atanasia, and he is the head sculptor at Carlo's Bakery, and he's one of the stars of Buddy vs. Duff, and you probably heard us talk about the sculpture that he came up with, which was the Zool that was shown on the Food Network and is amazing. So we immediately reached out to him to see if he would come on the show, and he agreed. So thank you so much. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Cool. So uh, I wanted to ask, just going back to the beginning, which came first, the cake or the dinosaur? So we knew that one, or we knew one of the challenges was going to be prehistoric life and that it was going to the Museum of Natural History. And we had done a few large scale dinosaur sculptures in the past. Cake sculptures, obviously. 
the first one we did Dryptosaurus for parapaleontologists at the State Museum in Trenton, New Jersey. Yeah. Oh, there was, sorry. So the rest of the, to answer your yep. previous question, but we had also made a, another New Jersey dinosaur, which was Hadrosaurus, which was the first dinosaur skeleton that was mounted for like public display, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, it was also at the time, the most complete dinosaur skeleton ever found. So that's pretty cool. We've got a couple of claims to fame here in NJ. <laughs> And at the time of each of these dinosaurs, I was really happy with how they came out. Like that Dryptosaurus, when we did it, I was like, yeah, man, this is cool. And then a few years later, we made the Hadrosaurus. And I looked back at that Dryptosaurus we did, and I was like, that is terrible. It <laughs> looks like a weird scarecrow. It didn't look like Dryptosaurus doesn't look like that animal that we made. It had like the the downturned like Jurassic Park bunny hands, and it was real skinny and just a mess. And then the Hadrosaurus, I was really happy with. I actually I bothered uh, my friends uh, Darren Nash and Dave Hone, who are both paleontologists, and uh, I, I really I bugged them to make sure that uh, what I was doing was going to be real real correct. And when it was done, nice. the three of us we were all just really pleased with it. And looking at it after what we did on Zool, not as good. Not as good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. You're getting more practice. Oh yeah. So we knew that there was a. We knew there was going to be a prehistoric life challenge. We wanted to do a dinosaur, and I wanted to do an armored dinosaur this time because we had already done like you know we we'd done a big hadrosaur, we'd done a, a theropod, and I was like, let's get. I, I want like a Theriophoran in here. I want something with mm-hmm. plates or spikes or clubs. Like, let's do that. So that was how we landed on that. We wanted to do something that we could do close to life sized as well. And Zul comes in around 20 feet. And we also knew that the challenge or the, the special skill for that challenge, because each challenge on this show had like a special skill associated with it. The special skill for this one was realism. So I figured if we were going to do realism, we wanted one of the dinosaurs that we had a very complete skeleton for and skin impressions if possible. Right. So when when our options there, if we're doing an armored dinosaur with a complete skeleton and skin impressions, our best bets are, are Borealopelta or Zool. Mm-hmm. And I knew that the rest of the team was not going to be able to say Borealopelta. <laughs> <laughs> So rather than having to correct them for 24 hours straight, you're like, let's do Zool. Yeah. <laughs> and it's from Ghostbusters. Everybody loves Ghostbusters. It's true. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's awesome. I was going to ask why you picked it over Borealopelta. That makes perfect sense. It does. <laughs> yeah, the name's much shorter. <laughs> Plus with Zool, you could say this is an American dinosaur because even though it's on display in Canada, it was from Montana. Yeah, well, North America. Where it's it's you know, it's yeah. all <laughs> dinosaurs didn't care. It's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yes, I've I've only exclusively made giant cake sculptures of North American dinosaurs at this point. <laughs> That's your specialty. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone in China wants us to make, you know, like a, a protoceratops or something, let me know and we'll fly out there. That'd be cool. That'd oh, be yeah. the shipping challenges might be Extreme, although Protoceratops got kind of small, maybe you could pull that one off. That's only the size of a sheep. That's barely even a cake. <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Who's who's that even going to feed? Really? <laughs> How long was Zool in the the museum? Uh, just that one evening. Well, I say evening, but we were there until the morning. Mm. I didn't get home until six, seven o'clock. Yeah. So you guys were up for like 24 hours making it and then another like many hours I, presenting it? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how much of this I'm supposed to really say, but the, the shooting day was actually broken into two 10-hour days and there were like 10, 12-hour days. And then we had a couple hours on location because, I mean, when, when you look at the yeah, when you look at the show, they don't really they don't really say if it's all happening in one day or what. It's just like we go somewhere, it's daytime. And then we're in the same clothes. We do the same thing all the way through. We bring the cake there and it's evening. It's <laughs> a good point. Yeah. <laughs> I should have been able to do the math on that. <laughs> yeah, no one's really said anything about it so far. Someone pointed out that Jordan Sparks in the Waitress episode is wearing the same outfit to her consultation before the thing as she is at the party afterward. 
They were like, <laughs> oh, yeah, this. <laughs> yep. She forgot to change. What are you going to do? Yeah, television's, uh, television's fun. So we did a little bit of digging, and I saw you had you have a blog, and you posted about a few years ago you made a chocolate dinosaur. Oh, I had a blog like a hundred years ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it's still up, just so you know. <laughs> it's still alive on the internet. The yeah. internet never forgets. <laughs> And that chocolate dinosaur is pretty prominent. I have, uh, yeah, there's a lot. I've done many, many chocolate dinosaurs. So how how do you make a chocolate dinosaur? How does that even work? Oh, boy. It depends on how big it is. It depends on what kind of dinosaur. Uh, the simplest answer I can give you is usually there's a rigid armature that gets built first. Something out of wire or, you know, like wooden skewers and things that are glued together. And then... You build up the chocolate on top of that. We use a chocolate that's called modeling chocolate. It's basically just chocolate and corn syrup that get mixed together until the chocolate has a consistency like oil-based clay. Mm-hmm. And really, at that point, it's more edible clay than it is moldable chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so then it's pretty easy to do the details. Yeah, at, at room temperature, it gets quite firm, but... If you heat it up a little bit as you warm it like you need it or, or you could put it in the microwave for a few seconds and it gets very pliable. And so you can sculpt very quickly when it's soft. And as it cools, you can start doing finer and finer detail. Oh, interesting. Wow. It looks like you used a lot of modeling clay for Zool, too. I'm oh, sorry, modeling chocolate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not modeling clay. chocolate is uh, especially the chocolate that we make at the bakery. It really can take detail really nicely, but it's also very plastic and you can work with it very quickly. So once we had carved out the shape and got our crumb coat of uh, buttercream on the whole thing, we were able to just drape it with big sheets of of modeling chocolate. We ran it through like a big pasta sheeter and got (laughs) blankets of the stuff and put it on there. That was so cool. I loved the texture that got added to it, even on the underside Mm -hmm. for like the little mini osteoderm sort of texture all over the bottom. Yeah, so those those scale stamps are a tool that we made at the bakery. One of the materials that we use a lot is silicone mold putty, uh, especially if we need to make a lot of the same thing in a short amount of time. Sculpting it by hand 30 times would take a long time. So we, we, we keep this two-part silicone mold putty in stock as just two parts, and you knead them together, and then it becomes like a silicone clay, and you can make a mold out of it and let it harden, and then it cures in its rubber. Nice. But what we did was we made like a little sort of mushroom shaped piece of silicone, but the top of it had little indentations all over it. So that when you roll it over a warm piece of chocolate, it leaves a scale pattern on there. Yeah. That was an awesome effect. Mm -hmm. Also the gumballs. Yeah. (laughs) That was my idea. I was very proud of that. That was amazing. (laughs) We were, we were trying to figure out how we were going to get, the look of all those ossicles on the on the back of Zool and uh, the armored sections. And my friend Dave Hone sent me some really great pictures of the actual fossil, which was super helpful. And we were, we were looking at it, and Buddy and the head decorator Liz and I are looking at this thing, and we're like, so they look like river stones. You know, they're like round, smooth pebbles of various sizes. <laughs> and we were trying to figure out how the hell we were going to do that. And we, we had like an idea that we were going to be punching out circles of of modeling chocolate with like a a, if you take if you sheet out your chocolate quite thick and you cut it out with a cookie cutter you would get what you imagine like a hockey puck kind of thing right like a squat cylinder Mm -hmm. if you put a piece of plastic over it like a piece of ziploc bag or something and then push the cookie cutter down over that it domes the top of it and we thought Uh maybe we would just make a bunch of those and just be producing hundreds of them and hope like crazy that that worked. And that was going to take a long time. And I, I, (laughs) so I I had the idea. I was like, well, we need to put something under the chocolate that's already round and is already edible. And the light bulb went off and I was like, gumballs cannot be expensive. And it turns (laughs) out they're not. There were some large ones in there too. Those gumballs, the huge ones? The, the Yeah, there were some very, very big gumballs and some very big jawbreakers. And I don't remember okay. which were the biggest ones. But yeah, we bought a bunch of those. <laughs> I th- we had tens of thousands. That was so cool. Uh, it yeah. was great. It looked like it was fun to That add. was the most fun part. 
<laughs> was there like a big base of something softer that you could just sink the gumballs into too? So yeah, the the cake was stacked up and then the cake gets covered with what we call a crumb coat, which is our, our first layer of buttercream that like we use to smooth out the whole shape. So we were just mm. sinking these gumballs into buttercream, which was really <laughs> Sounds cool. Sounds delicious. <laughs> and I got a lot of the time when I get particular about, you know, like dinosaur stuff or, or even just simple historical accuracy uh, for things like we made a Viking cake and uh, I kept telling Buddy that Viking helmets didn't have horns. And he was like, well, then why do they always have horns? Uh, you got me, Chief. Uh, <laughs> So uh, usually when I try to promote some level of accuracy, I get a lot of pushback for it. But on this one, everybody was just on board. And I was like, okay, they're going to be like two rings of ossicles on the neck. And then there's this many. And then over the hips, there's a big kind of shield. And then it goes back to this many. And everyone was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. We had like a diagram laying out where all of the spines of different sizes that came out of the armor and you know around the, the sides of it. Mm-hmm. And... We just went to work, man. It was like production line. <laughs> wow. So it sounds like you had a lot of reference material. I did. We had some really good pictures of uh, of the fossil mount and the cast of the armor on the back. And then we had uh, Victoria Arbor and David. Oh, Evan. Yes, thank you. Yeah, their book. We, we had that Zool book, which was really helpful. Nice. Nice. Yeah, we were wondering, about because they don't show that that much in the episode. Yeah, we didn't really have the rights to show their book on television. Sure, mm, sure. Yeah. We're impressed with your drawing, too. He made oh, that look you. really effortless. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah, because I think you drew like a really large version of it, right, for the reference. And it was just on like the, up there. On the whiteboard. Yeah, it's not a particularly accurate drawing, but thank you. That's better than I could have done. <laughs> and then they, I really enjoyed, too. I didn't realize, I, mu- I must have missed that part of the challenge was the realistic aspect of it. But I really appreciated how, when it got to the museum, they were comparing yours to the the other kind of diorama of multiple dinosaurs. And they're mm-hmm. like, these didn't live at the same time. Why is it in tar? There's like a volcano. Like, yeah. what is going on? Like, right. This thing has teeth and it shouldn't have teeth. And then they go to yours and they're like, well, it's pretty much perfect. <laughs> Yeah. It seemed like there was a, a bit of a struggle to critique. <laughs> Mark uh, Mark Norell said that if he could have kept that in the museum, he would hardly have had to change anything for it to be a display there, which was That's a so huge cool. compliment. Yeah. yeah, that is so cool. <laughs> what would you have done if you had another day? That's a good question. Uh, we definitely wanted to do more with the, the environment that she was in because our, our Zool, who we named Dana. Who's the Dana named after? Dana Barrett from Ghostbusters. Uh, uh, makes sense. <laughs> there is no Dana, only Zool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we would have liked to have done a little bit more with the environment she was in. As it was, it was just earth and ferns. Mm-hmm. I, originally, she was supposed to be at the edge of like a riverbank. And her pose was supposed to be a little bit more like with her head turned so she could see what her tail was swinging at. <laughs> but we had like a whole list of period appropriate plant life or at least plants that have living descendants that are similar you know Mm -hmm. magnolias uh, dogwoods different ferns a couple of other things that we were going to put in there and it just we didn't have the time for it but we wanted to recreate her environment as well yeah we brought a lot of silly stuff too like i had cockroach molds and and (laughs) frogs that i was going to make like all this stuff and you said it at the end it weighed like three thousand pounds or something right that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was so buddy said that on the show and i don't know where that number came from but then, <laughs> if it was three thousand pounds there's no way the five of us would have moved it uh, <laughs> it was our estimate at the time was about 1700 pounds which is still a lot it's close still, to yeah. a ton but yeah. every time every time it got talked about that number went up <laughs> <laughs> and I watched the show. It was like, this thing's 3,000 pounds. And I'm like, hey, if there were two of them. <laughs> That's how it felt by the end. <laughs> yeah. It's heavier as your arms get tired. There was a, there was this serendipitous moment of nonsense at one point. So that we, we had built the thing on wheels. We had these big heavy duty casters that were attached to the bottom of the base. Right. Mm-hmm. And we put the only place we could put handles 
was around the wooden board that the wheels were on, which is quite close to the floor. <laughs> and so we're, we're, we're pulling this thing. Everybody's like getting down low to make sure that we can get it. We get to the big studio doors and somebody had to stand up and hold them open so we could get down and wheel this thing and, and walk it down the hallway. And I stopped and I just went, open the door, get on the floor. Everybody walk the dinosaur. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some of the other um, like real big points of that build. Oh, Aaron, the eyes that Aaron McGinn, uh, our head of oh, R and yeah. made for that cake were astounding. Yeah, they were amazing. And when you put the eyelid over the top of it too, especially you know it looked just like the Zool eye. Mm-hmm. It was like that skull. You could remember what it looked like, and then I was like, "Yep." Then there's the real eye in it. <laughs> That's very cool. If I could change one thing, I would have made that upper eyelid thicker because i think there's supposed to be a bone associated with it it still looked i mean with the modeling chocolate you know it's not like our skin it's still relatively thick so i think it it looked pretty good yeah. had to get but um that technique when aaron was explaining to me what she wanted to do and like the the sort of like layered effect where you'd have like the the clear sclera over the eye and then you'd have the the pupil and the iris recessed into it I was I was really excited. And when she started making them, she was making them all slitty pupils. And she was like, yeah, like a dinosaur eye. And I was like, I mean, maybe, but you get that more in like nocturnal animals. And, you know, if this was like a, I, I just, I didn't think there was any reason for it to, to, I didn't think there was any reason for us to assume that it would be a vertical slit pupil. Yeah. And we went back and forth on that for a while, but uh, we wound up doing round pupils. I think you made the right call. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. happy with how they looked. They look great. Yeah, it would have been the one thing that you would f- kind of fixate on if it had the slit pupil. You'd be like, "Well, is that a maybe?" But since it was you know, standard eye, you know, then you could yeah. focus on the rest of it without getting distracted. And it it gave her such a uh, like such a placid kind of pleasant expression. Those big mm-hmm. soft mm-hmm. eyes and that that they're just she was very aesthetically pleasing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love ankylosaurs. So I was so excited when I saw you guys immediately because they show you an AM and H go over to the club and you're like, well, this is an ankylosaur. And I was like, yes. ankylosaurs!" I was so happy about her hips. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Her her hips and her gut, because people don't realize like I think the the lay person, which, you know, I mean, includes me, if I'm being honest, doesn't realize how thick those ladies were. (laughs) <laughs> like they they had big big broad hips and big wide bellies you know if, if your entire exposure to ankylosaurs is plastic dinosaur toys from your childhood it might look wrong to you but they had thunder thighs <laughs> <laughs> yeah they're sort of like a turtle shape more than anything in a dinosaur toy yeah, but it makes sense if you stop to think about it for even a second, because they're they're that defining thing that we you know, at least some of them had was that that big club at the end of a tail, and to swing that back and forth, you've got to have that big caudofemoralis muscle in there. You have like you need places for that muscle to anchor onto. And there's going to be a lot of like movement and stress on the base of that. Like that has to be wide and solid <laughs> where the tail meets the body. Yeah. Garrett was hoping that uh, you'd use the tail to bash into the other cake. Yeah. Uh, well, now we don't we don't play like that, but they did put a little baby Zool drowning in their tar pit. <laughs> yeah, we saw. <laughs> <laughs> now I love the 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 people on Duff's team. I absolutely adore. I also really like Duff, but you know, you know Jeff and Natalie and, uh, and and Sunny, they're just fantastic and incredibly talented artists. But they're not, they don't live in this world. And so, like, when I found out what they were doing, Duff's like, yeah, it's going to be great. You know, we're doing a Quetzalcoatlus, which is like this big pterosaur. And I'm like, yeah, Duff, I know what it is. And he's like, it's it's going to be, it's going to take a big chunk out of the Stegosaurus's tail. And I was like, so he's a time-traveling Quetzalcoatlus. And he's like, no, what? <laughs> oh, man. I thought their Stegosaurus did look really good, though. The Stegosaurus was nice. I think the yeah. the worst thing, the worst mistake they made was the plates seemed pretty evenly paired with each other instead of staggered. Yeah, mm-hmm. but 
beyond that, like it had the right number of toes. The the facial anatomy wasn't bad. It, it mm-hmm. and, you know, what you saw of the body looked right. Yeah. Yeah. It looked pretty I slick. I really liked it. But then it had the Quetzalcoatlus with teeth and the kind of a weird body and well, did weird like wings the, uh, on top of it. <laughs> I did like the feathered look. Oh, yeah. They did the really cool texture. They had a cool texture on both of theirs, too. Yes. Mm-hmm. And the the technique for doing the the the, the kind of pycnofibers that Natalie did is the simplest thing in the world, but it looks so good. You mm-hmm. just, mm-hmm. just take a scissor, you just do little snips into the chocolate, and it makes these consummate V's. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. So did anyone get to eat the cakes after? I think some of the cakes were eaten, but a lot of it wound up getting disposed of because uh, mm. there was a lot of cake on there. <laughs> yep. It's hard to eat that many gumballs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the jawbreakers too. <laughs> um, yeah. Did you guys uh, want to know any other stuff? I guess generally, I would ask, like, what was the first dinosaur food creation that you ever made? If you remember, uh, you know, the very first dinosaur food sculpture I did was actually the day that I visited the bakery for the first time. Oh, what was that? So, I, I my aunt and her children who are my cousins. This is an awkward way to say this. My cousins and my aunt and uncle, uh, they were big fans of the show when it first came out. And they won a raffle or something, and the prize was uh, for six people to go meet the cake boss and his crew and make cakes with them for the afternoon. This was when the show had first started out and was really quickly gaining popularity. I had yet to hear about it, but they had an extra slot you know, because there were five of them and they're like, Ralphie, you got to come with us. They're going to see what a good sculptor you are. They're going to give you a job. You're going to be on TV you're going to be famous. And I was like, I, I, all right. Um, <laughs> but then that's exactly what happened. I went there and I, I was <laughs> playing with the modeling chocolate and I made like a little dinosaur out of it. And one of the guys there, Mauro, uh, took a look at it. And he goes, that's pretty good. Can you do people? And I was like, yeah, I can do people. And I did a, did a little bust of Buddy with like a piping bag. And Mauro called Buddy over and Buddy looked at it and he goes, yeah, all right, all right. And he says something to Mauro and he walks away and Mauro looks at me and he goes, give me your phone number. Your is mine. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they called me up on my drive home and asked if I could come in the next day. And I've been working there ever since. Wow. That's awesome. That's a great story. Yeah. I was the, I was the head of my department within a couple of months and uh, that's, I guess about as high as you can advance in the sculpture department is being in charge of it. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. My, That's really cool. Upward mobility in, in my particular field. Uh, I, I reached the top pretty early on. <laughs> yeah. And now your family, uh, they uh, often remind you that they told you. It comes your up. Your aunt and uncle hitting you up for cakes constantly. <laughs> it, it, it does come up. <laughs> What was the dinosaur that you made that impressed them so much? It was just a little like, like a like the top half of a T Rex. Oh, nice! And this is uh, again peeling back the curtain a little bit. So that was my real first day, and then after I was, they were shooting the third season at the time I got hired, and I was in like every episode, you know, and it just <laughs> Buddy and I hit it off. Like we we worked together on on things pretty closely. And the work that I was doing wound up on like almost every cake. And they were like, well, we have to introduce this guy. We don't know. Nobody knows who he is. So we shot a fake first day where I came <laughs> in and I made a dinosaur. So, <laughs> Did you make the same type of dinosaur the second time? I mean, like I made an orange T-Rex with like blue polka dots. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, the, the first episode of season three of Cake Boss. You see me come in and make this orange T-Rex and that's my first day, but that's not my real first day. Good less nerve wracking. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Yeah, that was I was like a hipster Victorian sideshow barker back then. Like I had like a <laughs> curly mustache and a three piece suit and a bowlered hat and a bunch of rings and Man, we all do things when we're young, don't we? <laughs> it could have been partly how they put you on TV. You never know. Well, I'm sure I'm sure the fact that I was a just absolute weirdo was uh <laughs> was a part of it. <laughs> That's great. So yeah. Cool. Is there anything else that you guys have coming up that you wanna talk about or just continue watching Buddy versus Duff? I mean, yeah, the by the time this episode airs, 
my favorite episode of Buddy vs. Duff will already have been on. We did a cake that was delivered to the Aquarium of the Pacific, which was a blue whale. Oh, wow. Which is closer to 3,000 pounds than the Zool cake was. It was easily a ton. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And I absolutely adored that. So if, you're, if you've been watching, if you haven't been watching Buddy vs. Duff, but you're curious about the kind of thing that we did on there, I would check out either the dinosaur episode or the undersea episode, because those are our two very finest, just absolute mad cakes. And the finale is coming up, and that one is Star Wars themed. Oh, cool. Nice. And we got to deliver that to Galaxy's Edge, and Billy D. Williams was there. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Yeah, it's very great. Yeah, after watching the Zool episode, I'm I'm hooked now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah, that whale, man. You can keep, get ready for that, because that is something. Awesome. We will. This is like one of the best shows to be watching right now, I feel like. Yeah, so. it's pretty zen. <laughs> Oh, good. It's very stressful for me to watch it, so I'm glad you guys uh, <laughs> find it comedy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of the dinosaur creations that you've made over the years. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks again, Ralph, for coming on. We are fully hooked on cake-making shows now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, we watched the Aquarium episode. It was great. Yeah, it's a pretty good physical distancing show, I would say takes your mind off of the harshness of reality. Just look at some cakes. It's right. very nice. At least for those of us who aren't making the cakes, I hear it's a little different <laughs> yeah, if you're involved. Awfully <laughs> stressful. <laughs> I guess like the Great British Baking Show. <laughs> <laughs> and before we get into our dinosaur of the day, quick reminder that we're doing another watch party on Discord of Jurassic Park 3 this Saturday April 18th at 1 p.m. Pacific. And you can join if you're on our Patreon at any level. And there's a wide variety of levels and rewards available on patreon.com slash I know Dino. They all come with premium content that comes out. Like we'll have an extended version of our interview with Ralph because a lot of times there's more stuff than we want to try to squeeze into the regular episode, but we figure some people would be interested in. So we put it up as premium content. And then at higher levels, you can also get the show ad free. You can get a shout out on the show. You can get copies of our books. And then when we reach 160 patrons, which we're only 17 away from now, we're going to be mailing out Sabrina's dinosaur art to everybody. So definitely join before then if you're interested in getting some art and make sure to get on our discord by saturday if you want to watch jurassic park 3 with us i'm pretty excited about this one because for the first one was purely like wow this movie is so great look at all this great stuff they did the second one is kind of in between with why did they do that like that that doesn't seem very realistic although the special effects are still great yes and then is some awe of the puppets and stuff i think jurassic park 3 <laughs> the general vibe is going to be oh my god why what is happening <laughs> it'll probably be more like watching tammy and the t-rex sort of vibe going on so, oh that seems harsh yeah but i mean more on that end of the spectrum than the awe of cinematic greatness end of the spectrum i do remember the dinosaurs still being pretty impressive i really enjoy the dinosaurs too yeah but some of the other plot elements are a little bit crazy mm. <laughs> But yeah, if you want to watch with us, make sure you're on our Discord. And if you need to join, head over to patreon.com slash I know Dino. And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Alaska Cephalae, which was a request from Thieving Raptor Lorenzo via our Discord and Patreon. So thanks. It was a pachycephalosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Alaska. And the holotype is a nearly complete left squamosal, the back of the head, with some nodes. It was an herbivore and it closely resembles Pachycephalosaurus and Prinocephaly, or Prinocephalae. Couldn't get the details on the pronunciation there. Anyway, the paper mentions that it's closest in size to Prinocephaly. And if you want to learn more about Pachycephalosaurus, we covered it in episode 93. And if you want to learn more about Prinocephaly or Prinocephalae, we covered that in episode 98. Alaska cephaly is estimated to be about half the size of Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis, and Pachycephalosaurus wyomingensis is about 15 feet or 4.5 meters long and weighed about 990 pounds or 450 kilograms. Oof. It's also estimated to be about three quarters the size of Prinocephaly, 
and Prinocephaly was about 7.8 feet or 2.4 meters long and weighed 280 pounds or 130 kilograms. That math is weird. (laughs) So one estimate is basically 500 pounds. The other one's like 200 pounds. Yes. But I think that happens sometimes. We get a wide range of estimates. Yeah, it could be that one is talking about it's half the weight and the other one's talking about it's three quarters the length or something to that effect too. So Alaska cephaly was described by Roland Gangloff and others in 2005, but as an unnamed pachycephalosaurid and possibly pachycephalosaurus. Then it was named in 2006 by Robert Sullivan. And Sullivan found it to be a distinct taxa because the squamosal had these two diverging row of nodes among a few other characteristics. The genus name of Alaska cephaly means Alaskan head. <laughs> the type and only species is Alaska cephaly ganglophi. And the species name is in honor of Roland Gangloff because he wrote about the holotype and also because he, quote, contributed significantly to our understanding of dinosaurs of the North American Arctic region, end quote. Alaska cephaly was found in the Prince Creek Formation, Colville Group, in North Slope Borough, Alaska. And it was found on a narrow beach at the base of bluffs on the west side of the Colville River. The discovery helped show, quote, a major faunal exchange took place between Eurasia and North America during Campanian time, end quote. And the Campanian was about 80 million years ago. Alaska cephale is now housed in the Earth Science Collections at the University of Alaska Museum. And for the 3D printers out there, you can 3D print one via Tinkercad. Nice. Too bad our 3D printer is busy making face shields. Well, that's not a bad thing. I guess that's true. (laughs) That's not really too bad. (laughs) (laughs) And our fun fact of the day is that days were significantly shorter when dinosaurs were around. According to a new study by Niels de Winter et al. in AGU, they found that there were 372 daily layers of growth in a bivalve. And we know that Earth's orbit hasn't significantly changed in that time period, so it's basically traveling the same amount of distance around the sun, and therefore the only way to get 372 days is for Earth to spin faster than it is spinning now. And if you take 365 and divide it by 372, you get 0.98 or 2% shorter days. In other words, 23 and a half hour days rather than 24 hour days. Hmm. And obviously a day in this context is a full Earth rotation, not the amount of time that the sun is up. But think of the lost time. Yes. (laughs) Or gained days. The bivalve in question was from the Campanian, which is the period from 72 to 84 million years ago. And the dinosaurs at that time included Euoplocephalus, Diabloceratops, and Corythosaurus, among many others. There's a lot less data from the Triassic. This paper summarized some of the other studies, but there was a previous study that put the Triassic days also at about 23 and a half hours long. But data from 350 million years ago, which is only about 100 million years earlier than the Triassic, showed that days were only around 22 hours long. So connecting the dots in a trend line, they think that the Triassic was probably more like 22 and a half hour days. So a full hour shorter in the early Triassic when there were dinosaurs like Eoraptor, Herrerasaurus, and Saturnalia than in the late Triassic when you had Euoplocephalus and some other dinosaurs that are less important because they're not ankylosaurs. (laughs) I see. (laughs) And just for fun, if you go all the way back as far as we can tell, the earliest science I could see on the topic was in an article by Scientific American where they say that the days four and a half billion years ago were estimated to be about six hours long, meaning three hours of sun and then three hours of dark. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's so short. And the Earth is still spinning slower and slower. I think what's happening is we're becoming tidally locked slowly over time is what they call it. And then the moon is also, the moon's already tidally locked with us. So that's why it's always facing the same side of us. Way to end on a (laughs) complicated note. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think a lot of people that are interested in dinosaurs are interested in astronomy. Yep, yep. It's pretty interesting that the early dinosaurs had almost two hours less time in their day than we have. Yep, that's even less time to eat as quickly as they can and grow large. Always comes back to eating. Really does. It's important. And on that note, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino, so I can get a snack. (laughs) 
Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes and join our community. Watch some movies with us on Patreon at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Thanks again. And until next time. Good